This is Stacey Olson, and I am um, a psychiatric nurse practitioner that works here at Frontier Nursing University and course faculty. I'm going to talk with you today about the opioid overdose and um, how this is affecting rural settings. So I'm particularly interested in this topic because I live in a rural state. I have been uh, raised and I was bo and born in the state of North Dakota. I've lived here for 46 years, and so I have an interest in how um, the opioid epidemic is affecting rural states. So within my state, how I have kind of became interested in this topic, other than that it's kind of hard to, to ignore it since that it's in the news and, and kind of in healthcare, um, you really um, you really can't ignore it because it's it's definitely a public health problem. Um, the governor of the state of North Dakota, Governor Doug Burgum, has um, put forth um, quite a few initiatives to really address addiction in the state of North Dakota, for example. And um, I think he's really done a nice job of, <clears throat> compared to other um, governors that we've had in the past, of bringing it to our attention, of talking about it, and, and really reducing the stigma of talking about how um, not just opioid, uh, how opioids are affecting our state, but even how addiction is affecting our small rural state. And every year he has a symposium or um, that's called North Dakota Recovery Reinvented. Um, and if you Google that, you can actually see the, the recordings um, every year of that. The event is free. It's usually a one day event and anyone can sign up to come to it. It, it does have a limit to the number of people that can go. Um, but many times he'll have people come from all over the United States and all over the state to come and talk about different programs that they that people have done. Um, or even providing updates on um, how different things um, are going in different states. Like, for example, he had um, a representative from Colorado come and talk about how the legalization of marijuana has affected the state of Colorado. And they spoke about it from the perspective of um, a health perspective and, um, you know, work perspective in, in that state. Um, and then he has, um, he's also had people from local communities in our state that have um, maybe gotten grants or funding from um, different resources that he's provided in our state and how, um, what their success has been um, thus far. So, and, and then of course, the, it's also in connection with our North Dakota Health Department. And so the Health Department will um, provide statistics about uh, where our state is at as far as um, addiction and our um, opioid overdose deaths um, so that we can see where we stand compared to the rest of the nation. Um, and to be honest, I mean, the, the, there isn't a decline. Uh, unfortunately, there still is, is a steady incline. It's not maybe as sharp as it has been in, in past years, but we, it's still a, a significant problem. The other thing that's really unique about um, uh, Governor Doug Burgum is um, his wife, First Lady Catherine Burgum. Um, she is in recovery. She's been in recovery for 16 years from alcohol, and and she really kind of heads up the North Dakota Recovery Reinvented. But you know, her and her husband um, do it in conjunction together. Um, but she um, is is the one that really is the spokesperson and, and kind of gets all the um, the folks um, from all over all over the country to come. She goes across the country to go visit them and invites them to come. Um, she's also been um, to speak with the president of the United States several times um, about um, how addiction has affected her and, and, and some of the different programs and things that are happening within our state. So she's represented as well. Um, and she's um, a very interesting lady and she has shared her story um, at some of the symposiums as well. So it, it's a very, um, very touching um, couple that um, is is really, um, they're fun. They, they make a, they put a fun twist to it um, and, and really um, help decrease the stigma and make it not such a um, um, gray kind of dark um, area to talk about. So what is the opioid epidemic looking like from a national and a rural um, community perspective? The opioid overdose epidemic. Between 1999 and 2017, more than 700,000 people have died from, the drug, from drug overdoses. 68% um, or 400,000 people died from an overdose involving an opioid. O overdose deaths involving opioids includes a prescription opioid and an illegal opioid. Um, illegal opioids include heroin or illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which is the fentanyl that's primarily coming from China, but it's sold or somehow distributed to Mexico and, and kind of coming into the United States um, uh, from Mexico. 
In 2017, overdose deaths were six times higher than in 1999. Emergency room visits for opioid overdoses increased 30% from July 2016 through September 2017. Um, so the latest data that the CDC has, so when I say within the last year, so the latest data that the CDC has is between 2000 is, is up through 2017. So, so that's that's um, um, the the newest data that the CDC has for statistics related to opioid overdoses. So, looking at um, overdose deaths from um, um, from this graph, you can again see there is a steady incline um, increase in overdose deaths. Um, overall, and, and a sharp increase, but in the last couple of years, and, and primarily this is related to the, um, the fentanyl that's coming into the country. But also, this graph shows um, males and females, so it shows gender variations, and you can also see a sharp increase in male overdose deaths um, at a national level. Um, so more males are dying from um, overdose deaths than females. And if you know anything about statistics related to um, mental health, uh, many times females are more likely to, to die from suicide overdoses than, than males. So this is definitely um, looking at statistics from an addiction perspective um, because we're, we're seeing more of a trend of, of males um, dying from, from overdose deaths related to um, opioids. So from 1999 to 2017, when we're looking at both rural and urban statistics together, drug overdose deaths increased in both urban and rural counties. Um, you can kind of see there's been um, a lot of variations over time. So back in the beginning, um, 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 it started out that overdoses were higher in urban areas, but then probably between like 2005 and 2015, it, overdose deaths were higher in rural settings. And just in recent years, so 2015 to 2017, because we only have data up through 2017, um, we, we've seen a change again. We've seen more overdose deaths in urban areas compared to rural settings. So um, this change um, it, it is probably going to fluctuate back and forth. But the real concern about this picture and this graph is that this the trend is still going upward for both rural and urban and even kind of a sharp incline, you know, from two 2013 to 2017, I mean, it's even getting sharper. So that means that we're having um, significantly increased um, overdose deaths. And, and that's what's real concern, whether it's rural or urban, it's really become, it becoming an increasing problem. Um, when we look at over, drug overdose deaths um, for for overdose, drug overdose deaths for females were higher in rural counties. Um, so when we break it down and we're looking at urban and rural statistics, um, so female female overdose deaths were slightly higher. Um, but again, alarmingly, um, males have significantly higher overdose deaths overall for in urban and rural areas, as you can see. Drug overdose death rates were higher in urban areas for most age groups. Um, so if you're if we're comparing um, and breaking out in different age groups, we wanted to see which age group was higher in, in urban versus rural um, statistics. Um, so statistically, yes, it, it, it was higher in, in most urban areas. But what's alarming by this graph is the the 25, for example, the 25 to 44 year age group. I mean, that's that's the highest age group for drug overdose deaths. So there's something alarmingly happen and happening at that age. <clears throat> Those are adults. They're not they're not teenagers, um, and and they're dying. And even the 45 to 64 year olds, um, that's a pretty pretty significant um, age group as well. So anywhere from age 25 to 64, these are our, our adults at the prime should be at the prime of their life, are, are dying of overdose deaths. Um, so, so this is a target group for acute management. Uh, you know, maybe that we need to, you know, do some um, um, naloxone, um, some harms reduction types of things. Get lots of education out to these folks. But this, the age group, 15 to 24, this is the group we really need to target for preventative prevention because. This is probably where it's all starting, where um, young people are just starting to dabble maybe in, in drugs, experiment, maybe starting their addiction, um, and it hasn't gotten maybe severe yet, and, and, and you know, it hasn't gotten to the point where they're you know, very high risk 
which is hap which is occurring probably in, in later um, adulthood, as we can see maybe from these statistics. So, so those are kind of some of the takeaways that I see from, from this graph when I look at this as to areas to target. When comparing urban and rural differences in drug overdose deaths rates by various types of drugs involved. Um, so um, in urban areas, more people are dying from heroin and synthetic opioids and cocaine. Um, you're more likely to see in uh, rural areas um, overdose deaths related to uh, natural and semi-synthetic opioids and psychostimulants. And the natural and, and semi-synthetic opioids are, are more like your prescription opioids. Um, so <clears throat> more prescription medication overdoses in rural settings, in rural areas, which I thought was, was kind of interesting that it happens to be um, that those are prescription meds um, that are primarily, um, you know, having uh, increased overdose death rates in, in rural settings. So in summary, although overdose death rates are slightly higher currently in urban counties, there's still a trend upward in overdose rates for both urban and rural counties. Males and females aged 25 to 64 are a target group for preventing overdose deaths. Address at every visit, primary care, OB, ER, urgent care, dental. So, so this group, we, we really need to catch them. Anytime they're coming into a healthcare setting, we need to have conversations with them, asking them if they're using, asking them if they need help, getting them to resources if we can, providing them with resources if we can. People that are age 15 to 24, this is a target for prevention interventions for addiction treatment, like I was talking about before. Overdose deaths were higher for heroin, synthetic opioids and cocaine in urban counties. And overdose deaths were higher in rural counties for semi-synthetic opioids, like your prescription opioids and psychostimulants. Both happen to be prescription meds. So we need to alert providers in communities that, especially in rural communities, that this is, that their um, overdose deaths in rural counties are more risk for, for prescription meds. So we need to make sure that providers in rural settings are looking at PDMPs, the prescription monitoring programs, and using the CDC prescribing guidelines for opiates. Where are the opioids coming from? So people who abuse um, prescription painkillers get drugs from a variety of sources. Um, many, many times, I, I believe this slide was really meant to be where do people, when they first get started, when they first get hooked on, on opioids, where, where do they get their first opioid medication from? And most people will tell you in their story that they got their first opioid from a friend or a relative. So this is where we can do some prevention because this means that there was some leftover medications, some unused prescription medication, probably in the home. Um, so we can, as providers, can do some education about what to do if you don't finish all of your prescription medication, that that should be brought back in and disposed of, or where, or providing in the community some disposal sites for unused medications, um, and really kind of get into the practice of that becoming the norm in your community so that we're getting rid of old unused prescriptions so that they don't become available to our young people because it's those 15 to 24 year olds that are using these obtained free from a friend or a relative prescriptions and that's how it's starting. It, they're very young when they're starting. Um, in a survey that was done on college students that I um, had read about, 80% um, of uh, college students had tried an opioid just for fun um, before the age of 18. So it's a very it's a very serious thing, um, and I don't know you know at that age some some kids just don't take meds medications and prescriptions very seriously, which is another point um, that we need to be educating people about. We need to educate parents, the general public, the community, um, and our patients about how um, this this really is a very serious thing. Um, what I like to show with this slide is. Um, um, again, there's different sources for where people are getting the opioids from. Some do get a legitimate pain prescription, and, and that's where they're getting their opiate prescriptions from. Um, some steal it, they're, or they're getting it off the street. That's the diversion of prescription meds, and then other people are buying it. They're, they can buy it for as much as 10 to 15 bucks a pill, um, stealing uh, pain meds from people. Um, illicit pain clinics or pill mills, and that's what the picture on the, on the lower left is, is demonstrating. Um, 
there's providers that will open up um, quote unquote pain clinics and all they're doing is selling pain pills, prescription pain pills um, for cash basically. Um, there's also the huge amount of illicit um, manufacturing of fentanyl that's coming into the country. Um, you know, so illegal fentanyl that's that, that's coming in from China through Mexico, and then um, also the increased use of heroin. Um, so I like to show this um, map of uh, the I-75 in the East Coast because when we look at some other maps, you're going to see that there's really a large um, amount of prescribing and overdosing kind of in this East Coast region, which kind of follows this I-75 highway. And this Dr. Wynne Stanley that I um, took this slide from, she is an epidemiologist and did a study because in, I believe it was Ohio, they had a large increase in the number of, it was a rural town, and they had a large increase in the number of HIV infections. They went from having, you know, uh, 10 HIV infections a year to like hundreds. Um, so it was a huge red flag. There was something going on. And it was right about the time when um, there's a large amount of um, the um, pill mills clinics um, opening all along this highway. And then some of the fentanyl started to come in and it was just causing larger and larger and larger numbers of people having being at risk for HIV infections and hepatitis infections. Um, so some of the public health departments were just were starting to see large numbers of, of these folks being come, that were being screened coming out positive. Um, and they were able to trace it um, to be correlate along this highway, which is probably a distribution route um, for um, a lot of the drugs that were coming into the country, which I, I thought was very interesting. How did this become a problem? And, and this goes back to that statistic that I was talking about in the, in the lower right corner um, of a study that I was reading about um, where a large number of college students were, were have used prescription meds or 63% said that they had used the first time before turning 18. I'm sorry, I think I said 80%, it was 63%. So a large number um, had used before the age of 18. Um, widely available, the number of prescription dis pre prescriptions dispensed in 2015 is 59.7% increase from the number dispensed in 2018. So larger numbers of prescription meds are being dispensed in the last, uh, last seven to 10 years. Um, accessibility, 23% of, of the, these statistics were from a, um, a site in North Dakota that I had been reading. 23.8% um, of North Dakota adults perceive it as not at all difficult for adults or youth to access prescription drugs in their community. So even the perception to obtain drugs um, is that, you know, oh, it's not a problem. And I worked in a jail for a period of time and um, I, I actually asked an inmate about this because he you know, had a chronic using problem. He said he had all the tricks in the bag of how to how to fake symptoms um, when he would walk into a clinic because um, he would go to several different clinics and um, and uh, get prescription meds. And he was a routine seller of, of pain meds. And I, I was curious about how he was able to obtain so many different prescriptions in a short amount of time. And he had his little route and um, he went to all the different little rural communities and we go from one clinic to the next and they kind of get to know, you know, which providers are, are more likely to prescribe. <clears throat> and uh, he had his little little routine of um, what, uh, what he would um, what he would look like when he would go into um, what, what symptoms he would demonstrate when he would go into the doctor's office. It was really an interesting thing, but kind of sad that 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 was kind of what his life was was, um, you know, his life work was was. Um, uh, was in, in you know and what that had, what his life had become um, in order to survive. <clears throat> um, so and then the accessibility, like I talked about from from the previous slide, sixty five point nine percent of people who abuse prescription pain relievers obtain them from a friend or a relative, and that's usually how it starts. It usually starts from getting it from someone that you know, really in particular. Potential solution. To this, educating patients about sharing medications um, at, at every stopping point and at the pharmacy, at a dental office if you're prescribing, um, uh, physicians, uh, talking with family members, not just people that you're prescribing to. I mean, I think we have to have conversations at community forums with police officers. I, I think everybody needs to know about these things. Providing patients with information about where they can drop off unused medications in your community safely. And again, I think that Police officers need to know about this, ambulance drivers, first responders, family members. 
keep medications locked up and in a safe place and in, in, in educating uh, family members about this. Are people still dying from opioid overdoses? On average, 192 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. So when we look at statistics, um, the CDC has um, maps of every year. They have a map for every year. So I took the oldest and the latest data, and they have a map from 2014, and 2017 is the latest data. But you can see um, the darker red areas are the areas where um, overdose deaths have increased. So the more red or the more darker um, peach that you see, uh, means that the state has basically increased in overdose deaths. And we know that there's increases because we saw that at the beginning of this presentation. So you can kind of see if you're looking at a particular region. Um, so you can see kind of around the Great Lakes area and like south of the Great Lakes area, uh, that area is really um, increased. Um, the Louisiana, Florida area, which again, that's really close to Mexico. Um, and then also it's really close to Mexico, that Arizona, New Mexico, and then uh, Las Vegas or Nevada and Utah. So it's just kind of moving moving up from, from Mexico. I'm just suspicious that those, since those states border Mexico, that that might be the primary reason. And especially since in recent, um, recent years, the, a lot of the overdose deaths are contributed more to um, the, the illicit fentanyl that's coming into the country. Um, this map, I apologize that some of the wording is a little blurry, but this is showing um, statistically significant increases in, in the most recent data that the CDC has within the last year. So the states that are red have the most statistically significant increases in overdose deaths. And again, it's that Great Lakes region, kind of along that east coast, along that highway that I was showing you previously um, in the south area, and then that Arizona, California area that kind of borders um, uh, New, uh, Mexico. And I, I just talked with a nurse who works in Arizona and uh, he works in psychiatry, but he sees a lot of addiction patients. And, and he said that um, they're seeing a large, in you know, recent, in last 10 years, a large increase in, in patients that have addiction. And he says it's primarily coming from Mexico. And I apologize if this slide didn't turn out very well. It's supposed to say the three waves, that's why there's a picture of waves, um, of opi opioid overdose deaths. So this is kind of looking at the history um, of opioid overdose deaths. And this is the way the CDC um, describes it. Um, so the first wave um, of overdose deaths started about 1990 in the 1990s. Um, and this is when we had increased prescribing of opioids. And you might recall this if you were a nurse out in practice. This is when we started um, assessing pain more closely, um, looking at pain as the fifth vital sign. We also had some better pain meds um, come out on the market about this time. We had some really great extended release Oxycontin, I believe, came out about this time. Um, and we were we were really medicating pain and we were medicating pain in high doses as well. We got really savvy with prescribing high doses of opioids for people with chronic pain. Um, and, and so we started to see some overdose deaths with prescription meds at, at this time, the 1990s. So the second wave, it was about 2010, we saw an increase in overdose deaths involving heroin. So perhaps people couldn't, they needed larger and larger doses of prescription meds and the prescriptions couldn't keep up or providers were like, well, I can't keep, you know, giving you prescriptions and you're running out too soon. Um, so um, people were having withdrawal and they needed something to take the place of that. And, and prescription pain pills on the street are very expensive. Um, so a lot of times people would turn to heroin and they still do um, today. So um, heroin can be, can be very cheap. So we, saw, we also saw um, a large influx of heroin into the country um, about this time as well. And then the third wave um, in 2013 and up to current years, we're seeing a huge increase in the influx of um, um, synth synthetic opioids or fentanyl and mostly illicitly manufactured. So meaning that it's not manufactured in the United States, it's manufactured in China and in other countries and, and, and shipped into here into the United States illegally. And the sad part is we're, we're also seeing this, um, I'd say spiked, but we're seeing it combined in heroin, we're seeing it combined in pot and cannabis and cocaine. When I talked with a gentleman that's a nurse in Arizona, he said that he has patients that have had fentanyl in, um, in, in their cannabis. So it is 
it has been um, combined in everything. So, so drug dealers are are putting it in in a lot of things. I don't know if they're doing that on purpose or if it's just accidental. If it's just sloppy sloppy manufacturing, um, I, I'm not sure. But um, you know, and and unfortunately, when other when things are contaminated and you're not expecting it, it can get people, and especially with with pot. You know, people are thinking that. Cannabis is generally not addicting and um, are using it recreationally and they're not maybe probably looking to get hooked on anything more um, and they just want to use um, some cannabis. So if it's spiked with some um, fentanyl that um, could really have some detrimental effects and get people hooked that maybe had no intentions of actually or, or get people sick or put people at risk of an overdose that really had no intentions of, of using chemicals that were that strong. So let's talk about providers uh, prescribing opioids. So the CDC has some interesting data that um, I would encourage you to go back and reflect on if you're interested um, in finding more out about um, prescribing data. They have prescribing um, rate maps by state and county levels. And in 2012, the rate of prescribing opio opioids peaked at 255 million at a rate of 81.3 prescriptions per 100 persons. In 2017, the rate had fallen to 58.7 prescriptions per 100 persons. That's the lowest it's been in 10 years. And somewhere in this time frame is when the CDC came out with the opioid prescribing guidelines. So that might be why we've, and of course, we've had the opioid epidemic and a lot of scares with all the overdoses. So um, we should see a decline in prescribing. But rates continue to be high in certain areas of the country. While the over, overall opioid prescribing rate in 2000, 2017 had fallen, some counties had rates that were still seven times higher than the 58.7 rate. So this is the map of all the little individual counties. And the darker maroon or darker red um, counties are the counties that have um, really heavy um, prescribing rates. I know this map's kind of hard to visualize, especially down in the south there. So I blew up um, one of the areas of the map. Um, this is the Kentucky, um, Tennessee area. So you can see the little individual counties and, and the darker maroon or darker red are, are gonna be the more heavy, heavy uh, prescribing uh, counties. Um, so you can actually click on the individual county and it'll give you uh, some more details um, on the map about prescribing rates um, in that in your area. Um, you can also look at it by um, in a little more global sense. So if we want to look in the United States and say, okay, where, where are these places that are having these high prescribing rates? And you can see there's a lot more in the south, um, a little bit around in the um, Michigan area and, and in the um, um, north. Uh, western part of the United States. So um, there was a uh, more than 19% reduction in annual prescribing rates from 2006 to 2017. The, the declines in opioid prescribing rates since 2012 and high dose prescribing rates since 2008 suggest that healthcare providers have become more cautious in their opioid prescribing practices. Um, and the high dose prescribing would be anything more than like um, more than 90 morphine milligram equivalents, which is, you know, taking several um, doses of opioids uh, per day. Um, the overall opioid prescribing rate in the United States peaked between 2010 and 2012 and has been declining since. The amount of opioids in morphine milligram equivalents prescribed per person is still around three times higher than it was in 1999. So they're still, we're still prescribing high doses of opioids um, more than we ever have um, in the past. Um, so this is a calculation and I, I didn't get into it in, in this um, talk, but the CDC website has some, has some really easy um, conversion um, uh, uh, graphs and stuff like that. So if you want to know, if you want to convert your patients, um, you know, Oxycontin or um, other other types of opiates that they're taking, they have some real, they have some really great tools and they even have step-by-step -step how to do that. Um, so they have really made some really easy tools to help you figure that out. Also, a lot of the prescription drug monitoring programs will also show you at a glance um, if you have a patient that is taking um, several um, opioid uh, prescriptions, it'll also have um, readings with 
that are equate to the morphine milligram equivalent. So if you're wondering if your patients are getting up there and getting into that high um, morphine milligram equivalent area um, rates, um, it, it'll kind of it'll show you that. And the reason why this is important is because your patients are going to be more at risk of, of overdosing if they're in that probably 50 to 90 um, range. Opioid prescribing in counties with high prescribing, um, the CDC was able to, to find some, some, th some similarities into counties that had high prescribing rates. There, although there was wide vari variability at the county level in the amount of opioids received per resident, counties with high prescribing have been shown to have the following characteristics. Generally smaller cities or larger towns, higher percentage of white residents, higher number of dentists and primary care physicians per capita, more people who are uninsured or unemployed, and more residents who have diabetes, arthritis, or disability. So are all providers using the CDC prescribing guidelines and how can this be reinforced? This really could be a possible solution for decreasing the risk of uh, overdose from prescription opioids. So this is, um, you know, if you go to the CDC website, you can find the PDF of the, of the uh, CDC's prescription opioids for chronic pain, um, and there, there's a link here for, for that, and hopefully everybody is implementing these into their practice. I gave a brief summary of what they say. Um, so the, basically what the, the guidelines say um, for treating chronic pain, um, alternatives or non-pharmacological therapy should be offered for patients that have chronic pain. Um, I have seen a rise or changes in, in integrated care, integrating things like acupuncture and massage therapy right into clinics. I've seen more, you know, more clinics be open to this uh, since the uh, prescribing guidelines have come come about, which I which I think is I think it's good to have it right there within within the same spot. Um, there should be discussions about the risk of, of using opioids if opioids are going to be used in practice, um, um, evaluating the benefits if you do have a patient on opioids and there should be stop points, you know, within a week, within four weeks, um, you should be evaluating the risks and the benefits of continuing on um, long-term opioid treatment. Prescribe the lowest effective dose, again, because those high doses, of uh, morphine milligram equivalents when you're using um, you know, large doses of opiates in a, you know, large amounts in a day um, that can put your patients at risk for overdose. The again, the pres prescription drug monitoring program um, also will, has a way of uh, monitoring um, your morphine milligram equivalents that, from the uh, prescriptions that your patients are taking. Evaluate for risk factors for addiction before beginning opioid therapy. You know, it, you might want to be more cautious in prescribing for patients that, that have addiction and, and maybe use more non-pharmacological um, or shorter term um, types of prescribing or even get more family members or other people involved if, if there's a person that's going to be more at risk. And also evaluating patients frequently with urine drug screens in, their, in your assessments of patients that you have that you're prescribing opiates to. Offer naloxone with, um, because a lot of patients that are um, going to be at risk for overdose, uh, especially if there's high doses of opi opiates being prescribed. If you know that your patient is also taking a benzo, um, they, that also would be another reason to offer naloxone. <clears throat> and, and offering naloxone not just to the patient, but to the family members, to the friends, <clears throat> community members that might um, have, have no people or loved ones that um, could be at risk for an overdose. Avoiding, and altogether, providers hopefully will are working on avoid avoiding prescribing opiates and benzos together, avoiding prescribing those um, CNS depressants that can put patients at risk for an overdose. Review the PDMP for your state to see if the patient is taking dangerous combinations of meds and, and of course, checking to see if there's any med diversion. Are they going to several other physicians and getting prescriptions and, you know, how what's going on? Um, so a, a lot of states have, have um, implemented this and it can be very helpful. Offering um, MAT treatment with um, Suboxone or Methadone. And so if your patients do become addicted to opiates or they have a hard time stopping them if they've been on them for a long period of time, um, you can offer medication-assisted treatment to help them uh, wean off of uh, the opiates that they've been taking. So there's several free educational resources available about how to treat chronic pain and integrate the new CDC guidelines into your practice. And even if you're looking for more information or more creative ways, um, I found there's the CDC has these interactive uh, training series. That was, there were several modules um, that were um, on the CDC website. 
Um, and so you can go through each of these and um, get lots of ideas and lots of background information, kind of like I'm giving you today, um, so that you can educate your patients and, and the general public about um, why these guidelines are important. Um, here's the link to uh, the training series. I also found that there's there's lots of other free resources. John Hopkins actually also offers um, a free program. You have to register and, and sign up on their website, but essentially it's free in the, and it's modules and it's professional education. It happens to be for advanced practice nurses, but um, it is um, um, pain management and talks about opioid use and, and again, kind of, kind of goes through the uh, prescribing guidelines and how to employ that into practice. Does the problem of opioid, opioid overdoses go beyond the provider's office? Absolutely. And, and this is why I've alluded to, I know I showed you like this Highway 75 on the East Coast, and you're probably wondering, like, why would she show us that? Um, I, it, this, this affected me um, in, in where I live. We had a couple of overdose deaths um, in the Grand Forks, North Dakota area where I live um, that were very significant and um, uh, traumatizing to our community. And um, it was interesting that this New York Times article came out in October uh, last month. And um, it, it talked about how this DEA agent um, was able to track down this uh, fentanyl ring uh, connection related to this uh, teenager that had overdosed in North Dakota. Interestingly enough, uh, the ringleader that was part of selling and distributing the fentanyl was actually working out of uh, prison. Uh, U.S. prison, which I uh, thought was uh, very interesting. So I think things like this are interesting to help understand how big the problem actually is and how difficult it is like for our government, like the DEA agents, to um, track this. And then um, from there, it went all the way back to China. And China really doesn't want to do anything about it. China knows of the, the individual that um, the DEA has tracked down as the um, person who's manufacturing the fentanyl um, but they don't they they their take on it is you know your drug problems are, are a problem in the United States it's not a problem in China so you need to take care of it in, in the United States type of thing so it's it's very uh, interesting and, and kind of um, a sensitive um, issue right now that they're working through with China um, but I think stuff like that is interesting and I think from a global sense that <clears throat> even as a provider we need to know kind of what's going on because it it absolutely is affecting our communities, our country. If we have an epidemic going on, it's, it's definitely affecting us in a global way. And um, to have an article like this come out in the New York Times, um, all traced all the way back to a teenager from my small rural community um, that was able to kind of help this um, attorney and, and the United States government to um, uh, you know arrest someone and actually you know find some evidence to support you know that that someone could actually be connected with this. Um, it's just very, very telling um, of the times. Um, but I think it's important to, to read about these different things so that we can understand how cartels work, how the drugs are getting into our country and how our patients sometimes are, you know, manipulating the system to, to get or use drugs and kind of where our clients are coming from. Sometimes sometimes it's your, your, they become your patients and they want to get better and, and then just knowing where they've come from to get to that point. And then here's the New York Times article that you can you can click on to, to read. It's important to understand the impact of the epidemic on your community and how this is affecting uh, current law, current policy, law enforcement. The problem is ongoing and will continue to impact your healthcare practice. Um, people can buy um, drugs, they can buy sex on the dark web and um, the, our government cannot do anything about it. They can't. They can't trace it. Um, so people are having drugs delivered right to their to their homes. I went to a symposium with a DA agent um, a couple of years ago, and they have no way of tracing things that are happening in in the in the dark side of the web, um, which is very scary. It was very scary to hear. I guess I thought that the the government could monitor everything if if they had to, but um, there's there's a lot of things that are are out of their control. Um, so it, it's a very it's a very scary thing and it's a very scary thing when you start to think of your, your children and how that's impacting them. Um, so I have a few books to recommend kind of on around this topic. Um, this um, this book is called um, How Rogue Chemics 
chemists are creating the deadliest wave of the opioid epidemic. So if you have an interest in, you know, okay, well, what is this illicit fentanyl and how did it all begin in China and how is it affecting, um, you know, being manufactured and coming into the United States, this book can kind of give you a perspective on that. You know, I'm not saying that it's science-based or anything like that, but it, it certainly can give you a perspective on um, uh, perhaps maybe where things are at. So I, on my way here to Kentucky, I, I came via Cleveland and um, I looked up and I saw this billboard. And so some of the um, things that we can do for um, uh, prevention are called like harms reduction. And I would definitely say that this billboard that I saw was uh, related to prevention and harms reduction. And this is what I saw. Of course, I noticed the donuts. And I love donuts. But then when I read the billboard, I was like, well, that doesn't have anything to do with donuts. If these contain fentanyl, would you eat them? They don't. Your cocaine might. And so when I read the article um, that was associated with this billboard, it basically talks about how they've, Cleveland has had a large amount of increased overdose deaths related to um, people that are using cocaine that didn't realize that their cocaine um, had been, um, you know, fentanyl had been in their cocaine. And they were seeing more overdose deaths related to that. So they're just kind of warning people that are using cocaine and, and some other products like water and um, trail mixes. Um, just your food in general, just to be very careful. So if you're walking around in those crowds, um, you know, just just to be very, very cautious and very careful. So some evidence-based interventions um, is in response to the opioid overdoses, um, alerting community to the rapid increases, providing education, providing statistics, going to com community symposiums, being involved, um, I think is very important. Um, looking at emergency rooms and seeing what they're seeing. Um, it can be very eye-opening to talk to some emergency room physicians and nurses and, and ambulance drivers and first responders to see what, what they're seeing in your community. Increased naloxone distribution um, to reverse overdose, um, overdosing and, um, and, and providing this to first responders, family, friends, and community members, lay people. And some of this might involve changing policies if, you're, if policies per, uh, don't permit first responders to be able to give naloxone. Um, that might you might have some work to do there. Increase access to treatment services, including mental health uh, services and medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. So obtaining um, medication-assisted waiver using telemedicine, um, changing the laws so more licensed addiction counselors can practice. Support services that reduce harms, which can occur when injecting opioids, like screening for HIV, hepatitis B, um, having clean needle exchanges, returning old prescription meds, providing naloxone is actually considered a, a harms reduction um, program. Um, providing, make, um, having good Samaritan laws available in your state. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Support CDC guidelines for pres um, prescribing opioids for chronic pain. Uh, report any prescribers that are, are prescribing unsafely. Uh, or report any clinics that you think might be pill mills or that are selling opiates for profit. Using the prescription drug monitoring program to inform your practice. Um, just a couple of um, some evidence that was found about um, increasing naloxone access. Um, uh, so there was some evidence from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, they found that more than three times the total of local sites um, provide naloxone. So there's been more naloxone made available um, in recent years. Nearly three times the number of laypersons have been um, having more naloxone kits available. We went from having 53,000 kits available to more than uh, three times that amount, 152,000. 94%, there's been 94% increase in states, which at least one organization provides naloxone. More than 2.5 times the number of overdose reversals, reversals reported from went from 10,000 to 26,000, more than double. Naloxone prescriptions dispensed from pharmacies increased 12-fold. All 50 states approved paramedics to administer um, naloxone. 12 states allow EMTs. Keeping in mind, particularly rural settings, non-paramedic EMTs are usually the first and only responders. So we have to look at um, if you have laws or policies that prevent um, first responders from administering naloxone. That might be something that you have to work on in your state if that's um, some if that's an area that you want to improve upon. Because from you know from these statistics, I'll show you in another slide. Having naloxone available and 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 giving it um, in an emergency can really save lives. So critics of naloxone distribution claim 
that naloxone will lead to risky opioid use. So meaning that if you increase and have naloxone available in a community, if you make it you know, available to people that are using, they're gonna be more likely to use more. A study in Massachusetts um, looked at this and they, they had you know, more kits available, made it more available to people in the community, and they didn't show um, any increase in opioid related ER visits or hospital admits. They, there was no difference with um, um, employing more naloxone programs in their community. So the distribution programs for naloxone, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, it prevents 6% of overdose deaths. One for every 227 naloxone kits distributed will prevent an overdose death. Overdose death rates will be 27 to 46% lower in communities where naloxone distribution is used. So it could be almost quarter to half um, lower um, overdose deaths in, in your community if you start distributing naloxone and educating, educating your community about it, how to use it. A study in San Francisco of 399 overdose deaths where naloxone was used reported that 89% of overdoses were reversed. So there's huge evidence to show that naloxone distribution can help save lives. So this shows the states that um, will allow pharmacists by standing order to distribute naloxone so that you don't have to have a uh, you don't have to go to your doctor and get a prescription order from the doctor in order to get naloxone. You can just go into the pharmacy. And I think the pharmacist gives you a little bit of education about it, and then you and then you can buy it. But uh, 40, 41 of 50 states, all the green ones, um, will, will allow you to do that. All but five states now have Good Samaritan laws as of May 2018. And this encourages bystanders that are using drugs to report overdoses. And this reduces barriers to calling 911 for help and provides immunity from drug charges. Because, I mean, if your buddy, if you and your buddy are using drugs and you notice there's something wrong with your buddy, I mean, you're obviously, the person that's using drugs is probably going to know. They're going to know right away. Oh, my God, I think they, I think they took too much. I mean, they're going to recognize that. So who, who better to call and get that person help? And if they're scared, because many times if they're using, they're going to be paranoid or scared, or if they have a warrant out or something like that, they're probably not going to call. So they might be more likely to let their buddy go or, or take the risk or try to put them in a car and drive them to the nearest hospital, which puts them at risk because they're taking too much time to do that. Um, so it's nice if there's, these laws are available, they can call, the police will come, and, and they won't arrest them for, for doing the right thing. The law really does vary. So even though many states have these Good Samaritan laws, the law really does vary. Um, so you, you can't use the law to like get yourself out of trouble and, and stuff like that. So, um, but but it's nice that um, there, you know, finding out what the law is, says in your state and how it works. Um, but it's nice that we can be able to to tell people that you know they can do this safely. And here's the. So um, the blue states are the ones that have some sort of a, a Good Samaritan law, 46 out of 50 states. Um, so medication-assisted treatment is the last thing. This is um, what we can use to treat um, um, people that want to wean off of opiates. Um, and also they can help prevent um, overdoses. Um, naltrexone, methadone, and suboxone are, are what are used. Um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine has guidelines that you can download for free. If you're curious about how to dose uh, or to help someone through a withdrawal, they have some guidelines that are available. Naltrexone can be prescribed by any provider in any setting. The advantage of using naltrexone is it's not addicting um, or sedating. It can be stopped abruptly. There's no risk of withdrawal. Um, any provider can uh, prescribe this from their practice. It's an antagonist, so it blocks opioid receptors and interferes with the positive effects of opioids. Um, so basically, patients have to be opioid-free for about a week um, before starting it. Otherwise, they'll, they'll go into immediate withdrawal if they start it too early. No waivers needed to prescribe this, so you don't have to go through the um, waiver training um, in order to be able to prescribe this. Um, there's an IM and an oral um, formulation of naltrexone. The IM... Um, Medication of naltrexone is called Vivitrol, and it's good for 30 days. Um, and this is good for so that you don't have so you don't have your patient that has to remember to take a pill every day. I think there's better results with the IM injection of uh, naltrexone, better compliance, better compliance with injectable form of um, naltrexone. Um, if you take if if your patient takes an oral dose, <clears throat> it's 50 milligrams every day. Usually, it's taken at bedtime. Um, and then it's taken monthly if it's injectable, and that's a 380 milligram injectable IM injection. 
Suboxone is a combination of um, buprenorphine and naltrexone, nal naloxone, excuse me. It can be prescribed by an eligible provider. Um, they can prescribe, but you have to have um, the waiver for this. And you have, so you have to go through the waiver training. Um, you don't need to attend a specialized addiction treatment center, though, so this can be done in a, in a uh, physician's clinic or physician's office. Um, it lowers the risk of opioid overdose, though. Um, the naloxone um, decreases the risk of abuse, um, in, but it does induce withdrawal, so the patient does have to be, um, you know, uh, take a day or two, I think it says that on my next slide, to um, uh, be free of opioids before starting this. Um, there's only oral dosing for Suboxone, and it does help with opioid cravings and withdrawal symptoms. So initiation is about 6 to 12 hours after their last dose of heroin or any short-acting opioid they've been using. If they've been using longer-acting opioids, um, they want to wait about 24 to 72 hours before um, after their last dose before starting. Um, they're usually dosed about 2 to 4 milligrams um, at a time and increasing in, in, in increments of 2 to 4 milligrams. And you would observe them in your office during initiation of the drug. And again, you can find more detailed instructions in the waiver training and in um, the guidelines. Dosing on average can is about eight milligrams per day, um, but again, sometimes people are higher, sometimes people are lower, depending on what their tolerability is and whether or not they're having any breakthrough um, withdrawals or cravings. Um, the FDA does have approval for up to 24 milligrams per day of Suboxone. Methadone um, is dosed daily, uh, particularly when people are first starting to take this. Um, there's a high rate of um, misuse um, and diversion of this drug. So many times um, it, you do need um, to have, be observed when you're first starting. Patients need to be observed when they first start to take it. Um, so um, there's increased abuse potential, and they usually <clears throat> it's usually provided in an approved outpatient addiction treatment program. So you're probably not going to prescribe this in your office, um, in, a, in a provider's office, unless you have some sort of specialized training to do it. Um, and in rural settings, you might there might be exceptions to that. But um, for the most part, this is done in a very specialized um, opioid, opioid addiction treatment. Now, um, sometimes patients will start out in um, an outpatient addiction treatment center for methadone treatment, and then they might go home to their rural community um, for future um, follow-up. So, so that's something to remember with these as these methadone cl um, clinics are opening. And um, so you might be, you know, kind of part of that solution and, and follow up and, and helping monitor patients. Initial dose dosing um, is 10 to 30 milligrams, and they're reassessed every three to four hours and increased by 10 milligram increments. Usual doses is about 60 to 120 milligrams. Um, some might need lower doses, some might need higher doses. Um, and then doses are increased about every weekly or every seven days by five to 10 milligrams, um, just to avoid um, toxicity or over, or over sedation um, types of things. You want your patients to be comfortable though and not to be experiencing any cravings or um, withdrawal symptoms. So both Suboxone um, and Methadone can be, have been shown to be safe and effective in pregnancy. Um, and um, neonatal abstinence syndrome may still occur in mothers who take these drugs, um, but it is less severe than in the absence of treatment because then your patients are more likely to risk uh, using opioids and using opioids in high doses and have, going through withdrawal, which can be much more stressful for the baby. Uh, research doesn't support reducing doses of these meds. So if someone's taking Suboxone, or methadone, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to reduce the dose um, to prevent neonatal abstinence syndrome, as this could lead to illicit drug use, which is greater risk to the fetus and greater risk of the patient even overdosing. So um, these are recommendations from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, so this, these are some different websites for um, how to obtain the medication-assisted um, waiver. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about um, getting the waiver for Suboxone treatment, um, there's some different um, different links for different 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 places provided. It's usually free. The the waiver chain is usually free, um, but um, there's some, and then you have to go through the DEA um, to obtain a, um, your your certification to be able to dispense to a certain number of patients. 
So in summary, consider use the use of the prescription drug monitoring programs um, to track prescriptions for controlled substances um, to improve opioid pain relieving prescribing, inform your practice, and protect at-risk patients. Consider policy options related to pain clinics to reduce prescribing practices that are risky to patients, promote distribution of naloxone, and promote Good Samaritan laws. Increase access to substance treatment services, including medication-assisted treatment for opioid addiction, and even a methadone clinic if you know of one that's, that's nearby, if you think that would be a better choice for your patient. Identify opportunities to expand first responder access to naloxone to reverse overdose. Promote and support the use of the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. Help local communities to put these effective practices to work in communities where drug addiction is common. Be involved in your community. Read, 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 read what's going on. Attend forums that provide education on the problems in your community. Be involved in, in, what's, in what's going on in your community because sometimes there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, and you might want to be involved to make sure that your, your community is informed about, um, about the science and, and, and um, what we know about um, safe practices. Be a part of the solution. Decrease the stigma. This is another book um, that uh, was recommended by a police officer at one of the community forums that I had been in. And part of the story in here talks about the cartels and kind of how they um, are employed in the United States and how drugs are moved into the United States. But it also, another part of the story, it also talks about how we came to the fifth vital sign, how we came to like talking more and more and more and more about pain. Um, so if you're in and about the, the provider that would kind of um, headed that up and, and then kind of about the skepticism that was that was at the time um, that was there. Um, so that's a kind of an interesting part of the story as well. Thank you very much. That is it.